Hello, and welcome to Dyslexia Devoted, the podcast dedicated to building awareness, understanding, and strategies to help those with dyslexia. I'm your host, Lisa Parnello, dyslexia therapist and founder of Parnello Education Services. Join me as we dive into today's episode of Dyslexia Devoted. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an extra special episode. This is episode 49 of Dyslexia Devoted, and I'm very excited that next week we get to celebrate the 50th episode of Dyslexia Devoted. I must say, I never in a million years thought I would be able to do 50 straight weeks of episodes, and I'm really excited that we have reached a major milestone, and on episode 52 will be the one-year anniversary of me going all solo with my business and being able to reflect on all the things that have happened this past year. So next week for episode 50, I would like to celebrate that episode. So I would love to include you guys in that celebration. If you go to parnelloeducation.com forward slash speak, you can leave me a voice message and tell me one of your favorite episodes. Tell me something that you've learned in this past year that we've been hosting this podcast and share with me anything else you would love to hear in the future on new episodes. So once again, parnelloeducation.com forward slash speak, and you can leave me a message and I would love to hear how this podcast has helped you this past year. So make sure you join us next week for that 50th episode as I have some fun surprises in store with you and can't wait to share them with you. Now this week, we also have something extra special, which is my first interview episode, and I just finished a fantastic conversation with Chris Blance from the UK, and she is a dyslexia specialist over on the other side of the pond. She was originally a biology person who was teaching science in schools and had a complete career change and became an Orton Gillingham trained specialist, and she has a diploma from the British Dyslexia Association. So she is well-versed in the world of dyslexia and has over 25 years of experience teaching in schools and private tutoring in her home. And now she teaches entirely on Zoom with students all around the world. And it's really rewarding for her to see students who are struggling with reading and spelling and raising them higher than they ever dreamed possible. Now, back in the 90s, she created a very unique mnemonic system to help a student, and you're going to hear more about that from our conversation, and a series of books called Spelling Success. And then later, she created a teaching course called Enchanting Strategies, which now has me very curious. And so I want to check out more of it after having that great conversation with her. And she uses a combination of mnemonics to practice really tricky spelling patterns, as well as Orton Gillingham style um, structured literacy approaches. In her teaching course, Enchanted Strategies, she changes the lives of pupils who find reading and spelling difficult and are falling behind in school and lacking confidence due to their limited skills in literacy. She uses fun, multi-sensory strategies and has had her course tried and tested over the last two decades and finds success lies in its simplicity and the ease of administration. And it can be taught by parents, teachers, and assistants because of the instructional videos that she clearly uses to explain it. It's like following a recipe and has been a lifeline for many of her students. In the world of full disclosure, I wanted to let you know I have not actually used her program, but I've greatly enjoyed her knowledge that she shared in our conversation that you're about to listen to. So I want to make sure that I'm clear that right now I am not endorsing any specific product or services. This is more engaging in a wonderful conversation with somebody else who has found great success in teaching kids with dyslexia. So I hope you enjoy our conversation and listen all the way to the end, even though it's a little bit longer of an episode because we had such a wonderful chat and we're being a little chatty today. So I hope you enjoy it. So let's jump on into that interview. All right. Hello, everyone. Let's go ahead and welcome our guest for today. So Christine, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started with those supporting dyslexia and also very importantly, where you are currently located? Because we are not in the same spot right now. Okay, well, I'm in, in the UK, and, and I live in the north of England, very close to Scotland, actually, not far from the Scottish border and not far from Hadrian's Wall, if there are any people out there who are historians. So um, I originally am I'm a biology graduate. It was when I was actually teaching adults at, at my local school to, to get through O-level human biology. that Actually, um, somebody came up to me. He would have been about 20, I suppose. And he said, um, has anybody told you about me? And I said, no. And he said, well, I'm dyslexic. And this is a long time ago. And of course, dyslexia wasn't really spoken about much in those days. I didn't know much about it either. I knew it had something to do with reading and spelling and writing. 
And I'm thinking, how is he going to get through this science exam if he can't read and write and spell? So I took him on as a private pupil for biology. But in the meantime, I looked up about dyslexia. And as luck would have it, there was a teacher who is doing what I'm doing now, actually, in the town that I lived in. And I asked her, she was teaching private pupils, and I asked if I could sit in on some of her lessons. And when I watched her teach, I was just absolutely transfixed by the way in which she was doing it, because she was also taught by the Orton Gillingham flashcard method. Yeah. Um, and I'm just thinking, this is absolutely fantastic. And the reason that I resonated with this, I think, is because I'm dyslexic myself. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't diagnosed as being dyslexic, but knowing, as I know now, what it's all about, I was thinking, yep. This was me when I was at school. Absolutely. And so I totally resonated with this. And so consequently, I decided that I wanted to specialize in it. And so the rest is history. But the strange thing is that actually um, all of this was brought about by a complete stranger knocking on my door. And I often think back to that time when she knocked on my door, because if she hadn't knocked on my door, none of this would be happening. I'd given up teaching to have a family and, and she had heard that I was a biology teacher. So she knocked on the door and asked me about these evening classes. So if she hadn't done that knocking on the door, none of this would have happened. Strange, isn't it? When you look back on things, tiny little events to think that changed history for me. Incredible. That's fantastic. That definitely resonates with me when you talk about finding out later that, you know, wait a minute, I probably had dyslexia. That's actually happened a lot with some of the students that I've worked with. When I'm showing the kids mm -hmm. how to do things, the parents will watch me and they'll say, oh, wait, I didn't ever learn that either. I don't know how to do that. That would be really hard for me to do, too. And then they start to realize, like, oh, wait, I think I might have dyslexia as well. Um, yeah, so what is something absolutely. that you wish more people knew about dyslexia? What is something that you've discovered you wish more people knew about it? Well, I, I wish that more people viewed it in more in a more positive light. I think that a lot of my experiences with my parents of my private pupils were they were they were full of despair as soon as their child had been diagnosed with dyslexia, or some of them quite emotional. And I'm saying, don't be emotional, don't be despairing. Dyslexia isn't a disability; it's a difference. Mm. You know, absolutely. That's actually one of the things I'm really careful about when I do things for the podcast and um, different things that I work with is like making sure I type in learning difference instead of learning disability because everybody learns differently and that's totally okay. And we just want to make sure that people don't feel like there's some sort of impairment that prevents them from doing anything. You just have to do it Absolutely. a different way, which is completely fine. Absolutely not. In fact, um, information needs to be put into the brain in a different way. And I remember um, very vividly the very first lecture that I had training to be a teacher. And it was literally the first opening gambit of this man's mouth. And those words stuck in my mind. And he said, when you're teaching dyslexic children, you mustn't give them more of the same slowed down. You must put the information in, in a different way in their head. And that couple of sentences stuck with me. And I'm, I, was, I was really inspired by his opening words. Um, and that's absolutely true. If you if you put the information into a dyslexic brain in, in the way that their brain needs it, not in the way that the school is instructing to teach generally, um, you'll get a different outcome. And when I think back to all of the pupils that I've had over the decades that I've been teaching and how the, their lives have been changed just by, you know, their parents finding out about me, sending them to me and using my methods instead of the school methods, transformed them. It literally has transformed them. And I can think of loads of these children who, who went on to get great qualifications. Many of them went on to get university degrees. Some went on to run their own businesses. One of my pupils has ended up doing fashion design in New York. I mean, the world has opened up to them. But the, the story that I like to give for this one is of a, of a little girl. She was seven when she came to me and she could barely read even two or three letter words. And she was absolutely emotionally strung up, hated school hated anything like that. She was a wreck. And I did the necessary assessments on her. And then I began my, um, this creative force, <laughs> this new method that I created in the mid nineties, uh, which is unique to me, this mnemonic spelling system. And I started um, this with her and she absolutely loved these mnemonic chants that I invented. And she took off, she literally took off. And so quite quickly actually in, in a matter of a few months she began to read books and she just 
started to become what what we call over here a bookworm. Do you have that term? Yes, in the yes, it means the same. Can't here. put a book down. That's and her awful. mother used to say to me, you know, I go past her door sometimes, her bedroom door at night time, eleven o'clock. There'll be a little chink of light, and I'll go open the door and say, do you not think it's time we should be in bed by now? And she said, I've got to get to the end of this chapter. This is too exciting. <laughs> she became a bookworm. And then she went on to get a degree in art. And then she went on to do teacher training. And now she's teaching and she's using my methods on her pupils. Isn't that great? It came full I mean, circle. Quite a few times this has happened. It's come full circle. That's fantastic. Yeah, I have a student that I taught her to read starting when she was really young, only a second or third grader. So that's uh, like eight or nine years old. And since I know grade levels are different for you. And now when she gets frustrated on her middle school work, so sixth, seventh grade, um, about 12. And now when she gets frustrated with writing an essay or something, she's like, I'm going to read a book. I need a break. So now reading is her escape. So to go from, you know, having dyslexia and struggling to now when something becomes overwhelming, her break is to go read a book is pretty fantastic. That's brilliant. So what is one piece of advice that you would give a parent or student who's currently struggling right now? Well, you know, (laughs) I would say that many of my mothers have almost had to become militant in order to get the kind of help that they needed for their children. So if you've got a child that's in a school that's not necessarily giving the help that the child needs, it's important just to keep on and keep on and keep on until eventually you get the kind of help because it makes a world of difference. If you get the right kind of teaching, as you will know, as you will have of seen course. yourself with you, you can take somebody that's a complete emotional wreck and non-functioning into somebody that just opens up and blossoms and starts achieving things. And so the right form of teaching, the right kind of help is essential. Um, ideally specialist teaching because then they know how to put the information in the child's head um, and, and that's what I definitely would would recommend that, that parents do but th- there is one humorous little story which I can share with you if you like I'd love to hear teaching it. at a school many, many years ago um, and I was teaching this little lad and, and his mother was very very insistent I mean she was regularly going up to this school um, and there was one morning I was standing outside of the receptionist's office um, and because it was one of these rare occasions when in the UK we had hot weather, the door was <laughs> open so I could hear what was going on inside. And I could also see through the window to what was happening outside. And it was this mother marching, I can only use that word, <laughs> marching up to, the, up to the receptionist's office. And I could hear the conversation between the two receptionists. And one of them said to them, oh, no, here's this darn woman again. What on earth is she wanting this time? And by the time the mother got to the window, the receptionist, of course, they opened the window. Hello, Mrs. Such and said, how nice to see you. How are you? What can I do? And there was this stream of abuse coming from this mother because oh, no. she was not happy again. But what, what the problem was that I was teaching her son one hour a week at this school. And he'd started to make quite a bit of progress. Um, and she was saying, you know, this school has done nothing for my child. And, and now he's coming to um, to Chris Blance and he's made such a lot of progress in the, in the last few weeks. Um, I want him now to have more lessons. I don't want him to have French. There's no point in him learning French when he can't do English. And she was <laughs> hammering a fist. On the, but this is the kind of thing that gets results. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't sound as though it should. But unfortunately, it does. If you if you're insistent. Um, and it's it's vitally important to get the right kind, and it, it's because it's time wasting. All these years can tick by, and there's the not the appropriate help given in schools, and right. all that is wasted time for that child or those children. Of course, and, and especially with it, that neuroplasticity. Leave. Sorry, I said especially when you think about that neuroplasticity of the children when they're younger and their neurons are still developing. If you can try to help them, the sooner the better the best Absolutely. results you can get and there you prevent so much of that emotional frustration that builds up over time. And, you know, I don't know whether you feel the same as well, but I just get incensed when I hear of the high proportion of children that leave the education system semi-literate. It's terrible. I, mean, I just think, I think it's shocking. It's, to me, it's a form of abuse. I mean, people are not doing their job correctly if chunks of the population of any year group are leaving semi-literate. It yes. really seems appropriate. Just, just, disgusting thing. We're starting to have a small revolution starting to happen that I'm very excited about. They have a new podcast called Sold a Story. Have you listened to that one before? 
No. Um, so it is an educational investigation into the way schools are teaching reading here in the United States and how ineffective a lot of the programs that 40% of the schools have programs that have been proven to not actually help teach kids yep. to read the way they need to learn to read. And so many of our kids with dyslexia, if the main classroom taught reading more effectively, then a lot of the kids wouldn't need specialized dyslexia ins- instruction because it does happen on a continuum. So if the main classroom has the right instruction happening, then only the more severe dyslexic would really need to go see a specialist if the rest Absolutely. of the schools totally taught a different way. And yeah. so now that parents are starting to listen to these episodes and listening to the research and listening to the investigations into how all these ineffective programs made it into our schools, they're actually going to school boards and they're doing what you had just you know, adv- advocated for. And they're going and saying, hey, why are you using this program? It's been proven that it doesn't work. Why are you doing this? And so we're Definitely. finally starting to get a little bit of traction and it actually hit the cover of the New York Times just a week or two ago. Oh, that's brilliant. That is really brilliant because really something desperately needs doing. It's it's quite shocking, really. really Absolutely. Is. So now that we've talked that some things don't work, I actually really would love to hear from you. I know that you work a lot with multi-sensory strategies. Can you please explain to our mm-hmm. listeners why you think they work so well and what some of your favorite tricks are to use to help kids learn to read? Well, I can easily answer that, actually, because I invented something in the mid-90s um, called uh, Initial Word Mnemonic Chance. Um, and it happened quite by accident. A lot of these things are happening by accident in my life, it seems. <laughs> um, I'd been teaching a child the week before, and, and she'd said to me, Chris, can you please help me spell the word because? And the, the something she came out with, the yeah, exact phrase that she ca- came out with, made me think of this particular thought. She said, I, can, I know the letters of the word because, but I can't necessarily get them in the right order. And I'm thinking to myself in the car on the way to school, I know what I can, haven't tried with her. She needs a mnemonic chant because by definition, of course, mnemonic chants are little phrases that you repeat yeah. and then you just simply take the first letter off each of those letters of the phrase and it spells the word that you're trying to spell. And I'm thinking, right, I'll try that. For, I, knew, I knew there was one in the school. Big elephants can always understand small elephants. And if you take the first letters off of each of those words, you've got the word because. And then I suddenly um, thought, I'm going to oh, interrupt oh, you for just a you. moment because I actually teach that exact phrase to my students. So my well, kiddos you go, you who see. come so to me, so that exact it. phrase gets uh, taught to my little munchkins who struggle with knowing well, the letters of that are. word. All right. Sorry, I'm interrupting well, I'm, you. I'm, Continue I'm, your story. I, it just made I'm me feel so int- happy. I, I think I'm going to introduce you to something that might even be a bit better. And I'll explain why. <laughs> so there I am in the car thinking, OK, I could give her that chant. But then this particular child had hundreds of words that she couldn't spell. And I'm thinking, could I really give her one of these little mnemonic phrases for each of those? hundred or so words or more um, that she can't spell. I thought, surely not. That's going to be incredibly confusing. And then I suddenly had this light bulb moment. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. To avoid that confusion, what happens if you start the chant with the word that you're targeting? So in the car on the way to school, I immediately changed that chant and began it with the word because. So the chant was because elephants can add up sums easily. <laughs> and I came into the classroom to this child and I said, here you are. Beth, she was called. Um, I'm going to give you a strip of card and I'm going to write the word because on the front of the card. I'm going to flip it over and on the back, I'm going to write this chant along the top. You never have to write that chant out, but let's get involved with the story element of that chant. So here in this mad little world of elephants in the maths lesson, you've got to draw a little picture. um, And I instructed her to go onto Google Images and type in cartoon and put in elephants in a maths lesson. It's amazing what comes up on Google Images if you put in cartoons. <laughs> and there's all you could then choose one to copy. So she drew this little drawing of elephants in a maths lesson and she coloured it in and she was smiling because it's humorous. And then I said, right, OK, what you've got to do now is out loud say that chant, let's say, well, let's say 10 times because you've got, you know, 10 fingers on your hands. So off she got from her seat and walked around the classroom because we are on our own in the classroom. And she was saying this chant out loud, because elephants can add up so easy, because ele-. and she got to five and her eyes lit up and she said, this is going to work. And I said, great, <laughs> get to 10. So she did five more and then she came back and I said, right, now using that chant, slow it right down and take each letter of each of those words in order and then see what you spelt. And of course, she spelt it right. And she was jumping up and down with excitement. Can I have some more? And I said, well, no. <laughs> That's all I made up. That That's all I have ready. So we had, well, we made some up together. 
on that first lesson. And she actually made one of herself, which I use to this day, for the word white. Starting again with the word white, white houses in the east. So she had this little pile of chants, you see, on the slim cards. Um, and the following week when I went to teach her, I'm thinking, she's not going to remember a single one. <laughs> she literally came running to greet me along the corridor, waving these things above her head. These are fantastic. I want more. Let's have some more. Honestly, she, she knew every one of them. She could rattle them all off, no problem. So she could spell those six words. And then over the next few months, I started to rapidly make all these chants up. Um, and honestly, by the time we'd done about three months of this teaching, she could memorize and use over 200. She could say off 200 of these chants. So I would say the word, she would come out with a chant, word, chant, word, chant, word, chant. And every chant that was embedded in her memory was now a word she could both read and spell. Uh, it was powerful. That's fantastic. So that's when I tried it out on all of my other pupils and it just took off. They all loved it. Okay. So hence the books. I've got three books out on them called Spelling Success. That's my favorite gimmick. Yes. Like. I always try to teach it to them like as phonetically as possible of like teaching them which ones follow all the rules. And so trying to remember how many of them follow all the pretty basic rules. Like for us, the word white follows all of the typical spelling patterns so that one we can usually handle yeah. but ones like because and there's a few other ones like thought and ought and you know because well we don't really yeah. use the word ought here in america very often except every once in a while it's on somebody's spelling list there are definitely some of those ones where it's just so hard because they go so far from our typical spelling patterns absolutely. that we typically teach that there's just well, a few of those words that really get you yep absolutely the, the irregular difficult they're called sight words aren't they really difficult yeah. sight words so that works a treat for those, but it also works really well for homophones. Ah, um, you know, I, I've got a I love that idea. Book of homophone chants, and I mean, I can't believe how great they are for homophones. I can give you a couple of examples. Let's say um, the two breads, the bread that you eat, uh -huh. um, the bread to do with reading. Mm -hmm. So the chant for the bread that you eat is bread rolls eaten at dinner. Uh -huh. So there's the spelling and the meaning. And then the other one, bread really exotic dogs. Oh, I, I love the idea of using them for those ones where it's the homophones. We've been working a lot of those this week with one of my kiddos because we're working on vowel teams. He's like, wait, I thought it was spelled with a silent E. I was like, actually, there is one spelled with a silent E, but it's different. Like yeah. we were doing sale the other day with, you know, mm -hmm. is it on sale or is there a sale on a boat? You know, those ones are really tricky because they both of them follow a typical pattern. But remembering which one's which is really the trick. Well, I do think I've got chance for sales. Um, sale when you're having a sale and selling something cheaply i seem to remember is sale at uh, large ex the exhibition sale at large ex so they're selling all the paintings cheap uh, <laughs> and then the other one um sale across icy lake uh -huh. so you know you, you get the image and you get the meaning locked in at the same time so i find them really useful for that that's awesome but the other thing that i teach and i use a lot of um i mean i don't just teach using demonic chants because as you know the, a gimmick and you're not getting yeah. the proper word attack skills so I was trained in the Orton Gillingham method yeah. um, and so um, I use the Orton Gillingham flashcards I have changed some of the keywords on the back however but um, when I was being taught the Orton Gillingham method I was totally won over by it I mean I think it's a fantastic method but the only thing that I would criticize slightly it's only a slight criticism is that it seems to be so thorough that it seems a bit on the slow side. And I was concerned when I started to teach my private pupils that some of them wanted to move on quite quickly. So I used uh, I used the flashcards, but then I created all my own associated word banks and sentences to link in with the flashcards. So my complete teaching program called Enchanting Strategies um, is half my mnemonic methods and then half the phonic method. And the whole package together um, is, is what works, which what which gets them. So they That's learn fantastic. word attack skills. They learn how to break words up into their component parts, um, and uh, the combination of the two, it, it's it just works. That's wonderful. Yeah, we have a sim the program I use. I'm trained in an Orton Gillingham based program. I use Wilson, and so it does a similar thing where there's like a whole bank of words and sentences. They're already ready to go, and that way we can do the yep. similar idea of you know memorizing the ones that are really tricky, like those sight words, but then trying to do as much of the phonic instruction as possible as well. 
And then I had a curiosity question for you, just for my own knowledge that I think would help others as well. Lately, I've been working with students with different regions of the U.S., and then this brings up a lot of discussion surrounding accents. And I know where you live, there's a lot of different accents as well. So I would love to hear how you support some of your students who have slightly different accents than yourself and or, you know, Mm -hmm. in the traditional way you would sound out letters. So like last week I was working with a kid in uh, New England. So the way they say their R's is drastically different than the way we say it here in California. It was one of those things. I'm very curious how you handle working with different people with different accents where you are. Well, in the UK, it's not such a huge problem um, between the regions, although the Scottish accent is, is a little bit different. But I do have one or two peoples in America, and I'm, I'm finding that, um, shall we say, challenging. Um, but the way that I get around that is most of the work that I do that involves flashcards with the phonic flashcards, as in the Orton Gillingham style, they've mm-hmm. all got keywords on the back. Um, and so I get them to change the keywords appropriate to how they cope with that particular sound. So um, I've got a, a pupil in Texas, for instance, who um, were doing the long vowel frame. Do you, do you do a long vowel frame? Do you know what that means? Yeah. Um, where we have all the all the long vowel frames yes. and all the multiple ways of spelling them. Of course. Um, and so we, well, over here anyway, we've got 12, A-E-I-O-U, uh, U-A, O-R, O-R, O-I, and E. Everything goes fine until we get to the O line. And then things get a bit strange because your O's uh, are not quite the same spellings. As, and, and it's, it's interesting. So what they're doing is that they've actually created a 13th line in the long vowel frame and added your particular sounds with keywords. So we, we get round it that way. I just tend to think that whatever their accent is, that's what we've got to go towards because that's what they're familiar with. That's what they speak. That's what they understand. So they've got to link their symbolism with their particular sound. And it can be done. It's just a bit more challenging for somebody in the UK dealing with, with accents in the uh, USA. But it, it, we, we get by. It's OK. Yes. <laughs> I I found it very entertaining. The other day I was cracking up laughing and the students like, why are you laughing so hard? And I was like, Cause this is stretching my brain. Normally I can do a lot of this teaching without even really thinking about it because it comes so naturally. But, you know, it's one of those things where I was explaining to him that even teachers have to learn. And he was teaching me something new in how to yeah. reframe my own brain on how I explain things because the way I explain it to a kid here he speaks the same way I do but the kid back there in uh, back east he doesn't speak the way I do so I have to think of a different way to explain it and so it's kind of nice to be well, I, to I had a few people who, who's, who's obviously in this country but his mother was from New Zealand and honestly she could not do the long vowel pack with her son because her her vowel sounds were completely different so Robert had to do the long vowel pack with his father, who was from the UK. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, but vowels are, are interesting, isn't it? It's interesting what different um, countries do with the vowel sounds. <laughs> Completely yes. different in many cases. Absolutely. This has been so lovely to hear about all of the things that you're doing to help kids with dyslexia. And is there anything else that you would really like to share with my dyslexia devoted listeners while we have you? Well, I, I think actually, you know, if If you've managed to get the right form of teaching for your child, what the next best thing that I would advise is to do lots of little bits of practice. So normally you see a pupil, I see a pupil once a week. But now that I'm teaching online globally, um, it's quite different to teaching the pupils coming to my classroom here. But actually it's quite interesting because what's now happening is that I'm, I'm actually a parent obviously got to sit with the child at the other on the screen and and I'm explaining to the parent how to teach like a specialist dyslexia teacher so there the parents are learning all of these new skills but then what's happening is that because they're knowing what to do they then between the weekly lessons can help their children by that lots of little regular practices and some of these mothers are absolutely fantastic in what they're achieving it really is wonderful i've got one um, homeschooling in america particularly um and she is doing an absolutely a brilliant job absolutely fantastic because she's able to between the weekly lessons put in little and often practice and her child is coming on really well so i would think that that's really important because a dyslexic brain needs a lot of repetition in order to get what is a pretty, you know, not very well functioning short term memory, because that's the main problem with dyslexia. Long term memory is pretty good, 
um, to get the practice so that the information gets put into the long term memory. And, and that's really what I would advise. Lots of short bursts of practice with yeah, whatever that, teaching methods you're using. That makes a big difference. I have uh, two children who are siblings. And so one is with me and then the other one obviously has to sit and wait their turn. And so they were with grandma or their mom or dad. And it has made a massive difference in how much progress the kids have made because they need something to do. So I give one parent or grandmother something to do with the kiddo while I work with the opposite one and then we flip flop. So then those kids, instead of getting one hour of practice, they end up getting two hours practice by the end of it. And we keep it low stress. They're, you know, overworked or anything. And it's made a huge difference. And we've been able to make significantly more progress than some of the kids that just come in, do their work, and then they leave again. And so it really does make a big difference. And actually, you know, with your your methods, the Orton Gilling methods, with my methods, um, what what you're asking them to practice is not difficult. It's just little things, little things like going through a set of flashcards often enough so that they're really, you know, there's no hesitation that there. Once they see a symbol, out comes the answer. With mine, with, with practicing the chants, they just go through the chants. I mean, one of my pupils could do in one hour 545 mnemonic chants. I mean, he oh absolutely God. loved these chants. It literally changed his life because he could now read and spell that he couldn't do at all. Um, and so lots of little bit of practice. But there's one humorous thing. <laughs> he was um, a, a child that I started on, on chants. And, and I had his parent evening with, with with the mother and she said now what can I do this was years ago before I did you know online teaching what can I do to help at home and I said well what you can do is just to make sure that when he comes home with his x pack and by the x pack that means the, ch- the new chance that he'd just been given on that particular day so therefore he hadn't practiced them as opposed to his tick pack which was the growing pack of all the ones he knew mm-hmm. just to let him go through that uh, x pack on a fairly regular basis so she told me uh, months later that every night as she was stirring the pans in the kitchen before the evening meal, she would shout up the stairs and say, Philip, chance. And he would come running down and he would just in the kitchen, just go through his X pack before he was allowed to sit down to his evening meal. <laughs> and so honestly, it made such a difference because the test that I gave him at the beginning, which was a, a high frequency word list of nearly 300 words, his first score on that was 16%. I then gave him a chant for each of those words that he couldn't spell, and he practiced them with his mother's help in the kitchen. And months later, I gave him that same test, and he got 95%. Amazing. And she came to me in the parent evening, and she was obviously, she was actually in tears. She said, I can't believe how effective this is. And so I'm, I'm so grateful to, to what you've done for my son. And it's so nice to hear people say things like this. It really is. It's it's great to know that you're actually making a difference. Yes. And so more people ought to know about dyslexia, that it's not the end of the world. Just get the right input to their brains and they can achieve all kinds of things. That's fantastic. It's amazing. But just giving the right kind of instruction can make a massive difference in someone's confidence in life and their ability to be successful and to not be so overwhelmed by school anymore. It has been great Absolutely. chatting with you. Before we go, where can our listeners find you if they want to hear more about you and your programs that you do? Well, my, my website, which is um, www.helpfordyslexia, where the for is F-O-R, not the figure. So helpfordyslexia.co.uk. Um, I've also got a Facebook site, which is Help for Dyslexia. I'm also on YouTube, and that's under my name, Christine Blance, and that's B-L-A-N-C-E. And also I'm developing um, a LinkedIn channel as well under Christine Blance as well. So all the information is on the website, really, if you want to contact me. And it would be nice to hear from some of you. This has been a very interesting chat. I've enjoyed it. Lovely. And I will make sure to link it in the show notes in the show description where you guys are listening to this episode right now. So it's easy for you to find the information about her. Thank you so much, Christine. Okay. Thank you for joining me for our very first interview episode. I really hope you enjoyed our conversation and got to learn a few new things along the way. And I especially hope that you join me next week for the 50th episode celebration. I have some surprises in store for you, so make sure you join us. And if you want to leave me a message about your favorite episode or something that you have learned over the last 50 episodes, go to parnelloeducation.com forward slash speak to share with me some of the things that you have enjoyed about this last year of 50 episodes and counting. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. 
If you want to learn even more about dyslexia, check out parnelloeducation.com forward slash courses. See you next time.